Hi guys, thanks for joining us for another Live Engineers 101. This week we get to speak to Will Blake, who is the front of house engineer for Stone Broken, Dead Kennedy's latest European tour, and in this video he talks about his approach to working with these bands and life on the road. So tonight we've got Will Blake, uh, a good friend of mine and a great sound engineer. Thanks for joining us. So just to start off, Will, can you tell us a wee bit more about yourself? Well, as you said, I'm Will Blake. Um, I'm predominantly a front of house engineer for various bands. I work for people most recently like the Dead Kennedys, um, Dan Reed Network, uh, Grandson, uh, Stone Broken and other bands like that, sort of more predominantly rock and roll music kind of stuff. That's my main thing is just front of house for a whole lot of rock music. But I do do some jazz as well, um, like Bob Reynolds and that kind of stuff right. um, on occasion and some indie stuff as well. But that's kind of the main thing I do. Cool. So it's mostly the, the rock yeah. side? Mostly rock, a little bit of indie, a little bit of jazz, that kind of stuff. Or, know, not to pigeonhole myself too much. Or anybody that pays you. Yeah. Basically that, yeah. <laughs> cool. And for those who are uh, listening to this and want to get into the position that you're in, you know, out touring with quality bands and you're on the road and making a living from it, how did you get into the industry? Um, tell us your kind of your process, where you started from to where you got to now. Uh, I kind of started quite early, actually. I started in a studio when I was about 11 or 12. Um, that was kind of my area. It was about 11, I started in a studio, doing little bits of studio stuff, but basically just learning the basics off people. Um, so that's kind of the key point, is finding somewhere where you can learn the basics on what you want to do. Um, obviously, I got a very early start to it. But then I went into doing sort of like amateur shows and that kind of stuff. Um, and just basically picking up a more technical background across the broad spectrum of how a show is put together technically. Um, then from there, really, it's you know, the usual kind of thing of moving on to doing your mates, band shows, small pub gigs, that kind of thing, and shadowing other people on shows, uh, moving up, then moving up into like crewing for events and various other things. So the kind of way the advice for getting into it really would be do as many things as possible, like small scale shows, push loads of boxes, ask loads of questions and say yes to everything and just get as much broad experience as possible because what you think you want to do, you might actually hate and you might end up wanting to do a bunch of different stuff instead. But even if you know you stick with the path you want, you might get, or you will we'll get a much broader idea of what's going on to put the whole show together, not just the one bit that you want to focus on, because there's so much more than just audio in a show or just lighting in a show or just video or just stage crew, that kind of thing. So the how I got into it, I basically just worked my way up through the basics um, and then went into small scale shows and worked up from there and just kept saying yes to things and learning new stuff. Whenever somebody was doing something, I just helped and just worked it out from there, basically. If I didn't know something, I asked. And I always just got told there's no such question as a stupid question. You yeah. just ask the question and you'll, we'll tell you the answer and then you know how to do it, basically. And that's, that's kind of what I did, really, was just ask loads of questions. And I got the chance to hang around with some really nice people who were like, here's how we do what we do. And I kind of took it and ran with it, really. So that's that's the, that's the main advice there, is just mm -hmm. take it and run with it, basically. Just learn as much as you can about everything. Yeah. So, it's funny because a lot of, or I was very much like that, that I was afraid to ask mm -hmm. questions because you don't want to look stupid, you know? Um, yeah, exactly. But I've, I've learned over the years that it doesn't really matter, you know? And, you know, when you turn up to a venue and you don't know the desk, I don't, yeah. now I'm like, yeah, I don't know how to work this, but give us a hand, we'll figure it out, you know, stuff like that. It's yeah. kind of the, uh, the norm, really. Yeah. So out of all the kind of artists you've mentioned there, uh, or ones you haven't mentioned, who's kind of your, yeah. your favourite 
or your highlight that you've been, you've either mixed or been involved in? Yeah, uh, those ones that you you go, I am proud of that. I think it's a difficult one to be honest. There's loads. Of, I've got loads of people that I've worked with a lot. Obviously, it's always kind of a highlight working with them. I think some of my favourites have probably been the Dan Reed Network shows because they're always just they're such good musicians. They're super tight. Everything's always so good about everything they do that you just cannot mess up on stage. They just play so well. Besides them, um, probably also Shahad, a band from New Zealand that I worked for. Right. Uh, they're huge out in New Zealand and Australia in that way. Um, and they came across to do a UK tour, and I ended up doing Front of House, and they were lovely. Had some great times with them. Um, Dead Kennedys, we did a bunch of dates, um, which we finished up in Europe with a couple of shows in Italy, I think it was. It was Italy or Spain with The Offspring. And that was a that, really big kind of moment because yeah. I was kind of like, oh shit, like I, be cool. I love the offspring. Yeah. I, I, I've been a fan of them since I was a kid. So yeah. like, doing that was kind of cool. Um, and obviously again, like grandson, lovely, lovely guys from America. Um, go, getting to go out on tour with them as their front of house early year was awesome basically because mm -hmm. again, brilliant guys super lovely really good music you know it's funny how um, you, you you get you just don't realize and then you do have those moments you, you you're kind of used to your job and then you have that gig where you suddenly go oh yeah this is this is why you do it i remember holy shit like, yeah like last year doing monitors for living color i mean i was yeah, yeah, yeah. it was the best Wild day guy. of my life Wild guy. oh it was such yeah. a good gig and I, I was such a big fan and then to be able to do monitors for them and get paid, you're just like, yeah, yeah. yeah just amazing, amazing. The bass player as well. The bass oh. player with this huge pedal board and this pow, yeah. when he does that, it's just like, oh, what? Like he, he's just like having a full blown like conversation through his bass, mm -hmm. it's mental. That's that's what I like about Dan Reed is they, they're so similar to like living color in the aspect of like, they really, you know, it's not just music. The way they do it, it's just something else above mm -hmm. just playing the same songs every night. It's like a proper, like full blown feel good, like feeling that comes out of it. It's not just they're not just playing; like they're just ah, oh, it's like a totally different thing. It's great. Yeah. Um, you you just can't you can't you can't describe it properly, but it's just a thing that's just like better than just watching a band play live. It's mental. Yeah, uh, you, you really mentioned to, you mentioned you were um, front of house mainly. Yeah. Um, just for those who don't realise, I mean, what what would you say is the difference between front of house engineering and monitor engineering, and how you approach them? Well, the way the way you approach it, really, I approach it fairly similar, but with slightly different aims. I mean, my main aim is always going to be make sure the artist is happy because if you can get the artist comfortable and happy and more so really actually having good monitors is more beneficial to front of house than a lot of people realize if they're a front of house guy mm -hmm. because you can actually spend less time on front of house and have less problems during the show um, if your band are happy and they're playing well because they're going to make less mistakes they're going to make your job a hell of a lot easier if they can actually hear what the hell is going on so the, the main aspects, I mean, I always, the way the way I approach it, I, it's very similar for front of house and monitors for me because the, the, the my first and foremost aim is getting the band comfortable so they play their absolute best and they can hear everything they need. You know, I don't want any feedback in front of house. I want to make sure everything's there. It doesn't need to be perfect, but as long as it's there and it's feedback free and it's at the rough levels it needs to be and I've markered any big issues, then the main aim is making sure they're happy with their monitors and they can hear everything. So, and the drummer's super happy because then the singer can hear himself. Everybody else has their vocals at a decent level. Yeah. And the drummer can play in time because he can hear what's going on. Mm -hmm. And everything else that normally ends up packing a stage out with chaos, you know, when the guitarist asks for 24 different things yeah. across three wedges that surround him, you know, that kind of thing, you kind of minimize that. And it's just, 
for me, it's just really, regardless of whether or not it's front of house or monitors, it's all about making sure that the band are super comfortable on stage and yeah. they hear what they need to hear, but they're not over-cluttering. Um, front of house-wise, it's just making sure that everything's there, it's feedback-free, and I've markered any big problems on stuff. Mm-hmm. I, I solve any big problems and I marker any smaller issues. You know, where's something getting boxy? Where's the where's the weird low end? Where does it punch, you know? Where does it get a little harsh? Where's the presence? Mm -hmm. I marker those things on the parametric and I kind of leave it. I spend more time dealing with monitors, to be honest. Um, Even when I'm doing front of house, I want to make sure that I've got the basic specifics in on front of house, but I want to make sure that I spend more time making sure the band are happy quickly so they can leave. Mm -hmm. And then they're not sitting, tearing their ears to pieces during sound check while you muck around with stuff. Do you think that... With um, you mentioned that you're doing front of house and monitors a lot when you're on tour. Has that come yeah. from uh, a financial reason, or is that just a wee bit more control? Is everybody in, in ears? So obviously that would make a lot of a difference. It's a bit of everything, to be honest. Like so, predominantly, like a lot of the bands that I work for. So with Dan Reed Network and with Stone Broken and that kind of thing, it's like. We are touring a desk, so we tour one of my desks. Um, and we have everything set to begin with. And then really we're just kind of tweaking that overall mix every night. With Stone Broken, because they're on in-ear monitors, nothing really changes too much. Yeah. With Dan Reed Network, they tend to use wedges on stage instead. Um and that um, means that there's a couple more changes depending on the size of the room and how it acoustically changes. But it's not so much a financial thing a lot of the time is, or a control thing, but kind of like it's the easiest way to do it mm-hmm. a lot of the time. You know, adding on, yes, bands can't always afford an extra monitor, like a monitor engineer or somebody else on the road, but sometimes they don't always have space if you're touring in a split, for instance, and you've got to have a tour manager and a merch person yeah. and that kind of thing as well, the driver, it starts to fill up quickly, especially mm. if you're in a band with more than like four or five members. Yeah. You know, it, start, it can start to get busy um, if, you're, if you're traveling in a split. If you're traveling on a bus, you know, you might be sharing that with the support band, that kind of thing. So again, it's kind of like, it's not just the expense, it's the physically getting mm. people there on, small to mid-range tours it's a lot harder um but it is nice to rock up at a venue and go i've got my monitor mix i just need to adjust it yeah i've got my front of house mix i just need to adjust it you can get everything set up really quickly with the crew check through everything get the band on they can blast through something quickly check that they're happy with everything make any adjustments and leave again and then the house guys can get the the touring support and that kind of thing that's on a, straight away. So I mean, that's a great thing. I mean, even it, I must... it does it does cut out a couple of steps. Mm-hmm. But it's nice to have a monitor guy, but it's not always financially or physically possible. Mm-hmm. And imagine um, at festivals so... as well. When you're doing a festival, mm-hmm. that must be so much faster because yeah. it's all self-contained in ears, everything done, and oh, you yeah. just you know you just have to work on it. Yeah. It's amazing how. You know, working, you and I obviously met from working in the garage together. Yeah. And it's amazing how many bands are now coming through the garage and they're either yeah. doing their own man- monitor mixing, you know, the amount of yeah. pretty big established rock bands that I've seen coming through who have got yeah. like an X32 compact and they're, they're all on stage min- mixing their own in ears. Yeah. And, you know, I'm standing there as a monitor guy going, I'm, I'm here, use me, but. Hey, yeah. but again, they want to be comfortable. A wee bit more control. Exactly. At, at the, the end that's, of the day, it's about that is them. The problem. Yeah, that that is the thing, though. Like as as we're saying, like when I was about comfort, um, it can to be to a degree. It cannot always be the best idea. Like I prefer to have a monitor guy on stage because it means if something goes wrong, mm. you've got somebody with an audio head screwed on who can go and fix it. Yeah. If there's an issue. Without that, it's down to you having a really, really, really good stage tech or a house person that can go, oh, that's the problem. Mm -hmm. It's nicer having a monitor guy. You know, if I could take you or Saul or anybody else out on tour, 
like every damn tour I do. It'd be like, it'd be great, you know, mm. take a monitor guy out on tour. And yeah, I've got somebody there that knows what we're touring, knows what's going on. Yeah. And I don't need to stress so much if there's a problem, you know, it's going to be very easily and quickly resolved. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I don't have somebody on tour with me like that, then I have to deal with it myself half the time. Yeah. And there have been points on shows where I have to run from front of house <laughs> um, to the stage, fix something and run back. Yeah. So you just got to do, do it. You you have, know, it's, it's one of those things. Well, as a backup, um, when the guys are using nine ears, do you use any stage monitors mm -hmm. as a backup just in case? Or? I have monitor mixes set up, but I don't normally tend to use monitors. If the monitors are there and it's not a problem to strike them, we normally leave them. But again, it depends if we're touring uh, if we're, if we're touring any kind of stage set up, like Stone Broken guys, a lot of the time they'll tour like their own, uh, they've got like geysers and a light rig and some other stuff with them mm -hmm. that they tour. So a lot of the time with them, we'll just strike it because they've got risers and other things that they want out. Um, and the, the light rig and stuff, it takes up space. So they're just like, we'll just get rid of the monitors. But ultimately that's something I leave up to them. I always kind of have the space there on the desk to do monitors if need be okay. because then it always just means that it's, it's pretty quick to just go and plug a cable in, and I've got a mix sitting there where I've mm -hmm. got something I can throw somewhere mm -hmm. um, as opposed to having to then go and try and rejig the desk mid-show so, um, I just always kind of have it set up as a backup. So in terms of your obviously with some of these guys you're using uh, the SQ5 the DX168s you're using isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah, I'm using that mainly, um, and then D Live sometimes as well. How are you setting up? Are you setting up like maybe a bank which is the front of house channels, and then another bank which is monitors, so you can have different EQs and gates and stuff for the the monitor mixes and stuff for the for their monitor channels, or are they just using so the same EQ? It, it varies, to be honest. A lot of the time, with the way I mix, it kind of translates quite well, anyway. Um, to what's already going on. So, for instance, for again, for like Stone Broken, for instance, um, I will do my vocals and stuff. Same, same with Dan Reed as well. It's like I do my vocals into a group. So I have a room EQ on the group that I can then adjust if there's any big stuff and I can do my general corrective kind of tonality EQ on the vocals mm -hmm. on their own and tweak bits and pieces dependent on the wedges, but then I have a room adjust that doesn't mess with the monitors. Right, yeah. So a lot of the time I'll just do the channels and then I'll put the channels in. Um, with Stone Broken, they have Kempers, so they'll be doing, normally I put mics to front of house. I don't like the sound of a lot of Kemper patches in front of house. So I normally tend to be doing through live cabs um, and then I mic the cabs. And that, But they, like, they quite like the level um, kind of glued to their ears sound of the direct feed for their mm -hmm. in-ears. So they'll normally take the direct feed in their in-ears and we have that as a backup anyway. Um, if the mic was to die, we can throw that in for front of house as well. Right. Um, and we'll, we use mics in front of house, but I kind of chop and change. There's no set rule with what I do of, oh, I've got a double patch set of channels. I find for my brain that just complicates things. I'll end up grabbing the wrong fader and throwing in the front of house one in their in-ear mix or whatever. I'd rather just have my channels a lot of the time. Maybe on a higher channel count desk, D-Live possibly, if I had the time to rejig everything, I would do it that way. But the majority of the time, I'll mix and match, but I'll have certain specifics that will go to okay. in-ears, uh, usually just a double up of a channel or a slightly different sound that they want. Um, of a channel will go in. Majority of the stuff that's straight up what comes into and goes to front of house is the same thing that's going to their ears. So do you prefer, would you class yourself as a front of house engineer, a mod engineer, or are you, are you both? What would you prefer to be known as or want to do more than the other? I, I, I call myself a front of house engineer because it's pretty much everything I get hired for is front of house. Maybe in the year I'll have I'd be lucky if I have five days of monitor gigs in a year. Wow. You know, the majority of the year, it's all front of house I do. Like, everything's front of house. Um, some of those gigs, it's front of house and monitors I'm doing. The majority of it is front of house. Um, 
there was a, there was a few shows on the Dead Kennedys tour where we had a monitor engineer, but the majority of the time I would end up doing it from front of house because they're quite particular about. I was your monitor, monitor engineer. Wise, I was monitor engineer yeah. at the garage. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I did that gig. Yeah, uh, that was that was that was a good gig. That was actually the first show of the tour as well before right. we went to Europe because right. we did we we only did a few shows in the UK actually. Um, we did Glasgow. We did London. Um, we did Brighton, I want to say, um, and we did a couple of other ones as well, somewhere around the middle of mm-hmm. England. I think we did. Uh, I think that that was Birmingham also a couple of others. From yeah. What I recall is, uh, and going back to the kind of monitoring, um, yeah. it'd be ama- It's amazing how some bands come in and they're so mm. pernickety about their monitors that yeah. you know you can be there for ages per person, yeah. which is fine. I mean, that's what you're there for. But you get some bands that in the sense go, cool, and they don't ask for anything. Because I'll say I go in, my approach is, if you get a vocal, vocal for the monitor, vocal the monitor, drums, bit of kick, snare, as an absolute basis, as long as I've got them all nailed in, and you get your guys go, oh, can I get a wee bit of this, a wee bit of that, and the sound check's quick, yeah, fast, yeah. done. And then you get the ones who come in and it's like, they want everything. Everything through each wedge yeah. or... I love it when they turn up and they're all in ears. To be honest with you, I prefer mixing, yeah. you know, the eight or ten mixes of in ears because I'm like, cool, that you can zone in and you know, you get to know what that person wants, you know, and it's a more of a personal and thing. You know, it's not. You know, it's not going to run away as well. Mm. That's the thing. It's like in ears is a specific thing. It's a difficult thing to hit, but if you hit it right, yeah, it's really, really, really good. If you know how to specifically do things. Um, the way they want, because you're basically just sitting in somebody's brain trying to second guess what they want, what they tell you, mm-hmm. while listening to it yourself. On in ears, it might not always be the same brand. They might accentuate different things slightly differently. So you're trying to do your best to hear exactly what they're hearing, but you can't just take them and pop them in. Mm-hmm. So in ears, definitely, they're great. But you know, if you have if you have the knack with them, they could be really, really, really good because they don't run away. You know. Once it's kind of dialed in, it doesn't really change too much, yeah. you know. And then you to get, a degree, they're, you they're get nicer the, than wedges to some, some degree. You get the singer who does the the old. Uh, they want to use their, their an ears and they have wedges as backup, and then they decide to take one out and then put one back in and one in yeah. out, and then just yeah. screw with their 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 head. And you're just like, please, yeah, just yeah. Uh, they don't realise how much they're they're just screwing themselves over. In terms oh yeah, but again, it's a comfort thing, isn't it? And you know, at the end of the day, if they screw themselves over, and at least if they're comfortable, ah, oh, yeah, it's okay. That's the, at the end of the day. That's the way I see. It. You know, they can screw themselves over as much as they want if it makes them comfortable. If they mentally go on stage and go, you know what, mm-hmm. I've won with whatever I'm trying to do. You know, whatever they're trying to achieve at that point in time to get themselves comfortable. If they achieve that, then sweet. You know, gigs a good one because they're going to do their utmost best, even if it doesn't necessarily make sense in the way of things as we would do it. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it just makes sense in their head, and then you're just like, right, okay, well, if that works for you, it works for you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the amount of singers who who have on stage, everyone else's monitors, they're in the ears, and they go, I just want my vocal in their ears, and that's it. And I'm like, yeah. man, that must be so isolating, but that's they're happy with it. And I've I've listened to like right, their yeah. their in mix, and obviously you can get bleed in from everybody else, but it's a completely different not what I would do, but that's again, it's whatever they're comfortable with. But yeah. now, I t- think it was there was there was one band we were on tour with, um, and the drummer, I can't remember the name of the band, but the drummer basically only has the ambient. It was Blackstar Riders, actually, I think it was, yeah. Um, the drummer has um, basically just the reverbs for the drum kit in his ears. So he relies oh, yeah. on the ambience, right? So he's basically, he's got the sound of the drums he's playing around him. He doesn't really add much into that, but then he adds on the ambience to remove the isolation of the fact that he's not, Mm-hmm. got it as much in his ears and it's mental because if you listen to the mix standing away from the drums apparently it's crazy um, but if you actually stand and play the drums yeah, yeah. it makes sense, that makes sense. It's t- again yeah. it's some things that don't make sense from where you're standing make perfect sense from where they're standing yeah so, so sometimes you're just going to try it and go you know what if it works for you that's great because 
it might not make sense, but if it works, it's right. <laughs> I, I think that's an important one for engineers who are trying yeah. to learn that is don't mm -hmm. just don't assume or yeah. make people do the way you think it should be done. You know, you don't force yeah, your exactly. your opinion on it and go, nah, I think you're wrong. You know, it's yeah. it brings me on a good subject. It's like, how do you approach bands, artists? Um, First one, like back in the days when you were a venue guy, how would you, you know, band walk into the building, what's your approach to them and how you, you start working? To be honest, I just let them get set up. Um, I'll approach them, I'll introduce myself, I'll say, I'm here to do such and such, have you got an engineer? Um, you know, I'll do the basic introduction but then, you know, if the stage is ready to go, I'll say, look, guys, get yourself set up. Crew's there if you need a hand with anything. I'm here if you need a hand with anything. Shout on me. You guys get set up. Have a blast around. Make sure you're happy with everything. We'll come up, throw some mics and stuff on. Um, have you got any specific things that we should know about? We'll just let them get set up and do their thing because, I mean, if they've just rocked up at the venue... The last thing they want is somebody going, is this the right set list or is this this or is that that? You know, asking them a million questions. They want to sit down for two minutes. They want to go to the toilet. They want to find out where the rider is and they want to get the, the stuff thrown on stage. So if you say, look, the stage is here, throw your stuff up and get comfy, you know, it's fine if then after they set their stuff up, they want to nip off to the dressing room for five and do whatever, you know, grab a, grab a can of juice or whatever, or a snack, you know. That's fine because then we can throw mics up. We can check stuff. Is is all there? Generally, we've already got half the stuff set up. So yeah. really, again, approaching new artists that you don't know them, they don't know you. It's just about getting them comfortable, finding out if they've got anything that's going to be complicated or any specific things they need. Mm -hmm. You know, have they got something crazy that's going to need DI'd halfway through the show, but they've not told you about? You know, the surprises. Make sure that everything they've got. Yeah, make yeah. sure there's no mad surprises. And you know what? If they're nipping off to the dressing room for five minutes to grab a can of juice and a snack, if there's a surprise, generally that five minutes is enough time to pull it out and sort it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not... It, it's, it's just about making them comfortable and, you know, straight away sorting out making yourself comfortable as well. After that, they go, okay, they're happy. They know everything they need to know. They're set. We'll get our stuff set. And then hopefully minimal amount of time involved on a sound check get them super comfy and go yeah. like simple, simple things like having the vocal mic working yeah and having it in the monitor before they come on so they don't spend 20 minutes of, like trying to sound check a microphone it's fucking horrible mm. you know a lot of the time i'll just tell like, even at the start of the sound check if we've got the basics and i'll just tell guys to start twiddling around if we're short on time i'll just let them just start do the thing and just start feeding stuff in mm -hmm. It's just knowing what to do. It's the experience of knowing what to do in specific situations just to make sure that they're comfortable and they're yeah. getting what they want out of it without, you know, screwing either party over, basically, yeah. but making sure everything's comfy. You also don't want to do that kind of, if you mentioned that after if they're short of time, you don't want to be that mm. forceful kind of way of, hey, come on, move it, you know, yeah, because, because it changes the atmosphere you, you in there. Push somebody, exactly, you push somebody, they'll take twice as long, they'll push back. <laughs> So if you if you push somebody, they will literally just push back. And even if it's not deliberate, just simply because you've had, then had a go at them, they're going to be like, oh, mm. you know, and it it doesn't it doesn't help. So you've constantly got to be the happy face and the positivity, you know. Uh, come on, let's get the let's get the gig going. You know, yeah. what can we do to make you happy? Yeah. You know, no. how can we sort that? But ultimately, not let people take the piss either. In terms of um, obviously, that's from a venue's perspective. Now, with you yeah. being on going on tour with bands and you're going to be, be, be away with them for months at a time. Yeah. How do you approach that? So uh, the first time you come in, meet the band and stuff, get pre-production, do you spend some time with them, just getting to know them? And I guess it just takes time to develop each person's uh, needs, you know, and what you need to do for them as a, an engineer. Yeah. Basically, yeah, I try and find all that out as quick as possible, basically. So generally on the first day, you know, there's not always... A lot of the time with me, there's not the luxury of a pre-production. You know, we're, we're, we're flying out somewhere and we're doing a show. Um, 
and the pre-production is kind of the first show a lot of the time you know i'll try and set stuff up in advance to some degree but i don't always have the proper luxury of oh here's a nice little pre-production space and we can sort everything out a lot of that just generally doesn't happen um again it's probably a huge amount of cost and scheduling and everything yeah. else involved in that it's just not practical a lot of the time um so for that i kind of generally with a, a new band that i haven't worked with before i treat it kind of like a venue again and i, I rock up and i do the same thing you know i try and get people comfortable but at the same time i'm doing the same thing with the venue staff and getting them comfortable because I want them to know that I'm not there to take the piss and I want them to be comfortable in my ability to get done what I need to do. Mm -hmm. um, so I try, I'm trying to cover both bases at once and, you know, get the band happy, get the venue staff happy, I put, put the two together, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully without pissing anybody off. Um, I mean, there's a times where there's a venue you've turned up to and it's been like pulling teeth and a bit of a, a nightmare. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's there's been absolutely loads. There's there's, there's been loads, um, mainly a lot in the UK. You tend to find Europe's actually lovely. Well, a lot of UK venues, you can find some difficult people. Uh, generally, on the whole, it's few and far between. You know, the positive experiences are better. Mm. It's it's how you deal with the situation. If you rock up and start shouting at people, you, it's never going to end well. Yeah. You, know, you know, you know that yourself doing venue stuff. If somebody rocks up and starts throwing the weight around. You're know, like, okay, well, this co this this cable's getting coiled ten times slower on the you know, <laughs> on the setup, and your your sound check time's going out the window. But it's like things like that, you know. If I'm on tour with a band as well, if we have to run on a little bit, yeah, it sucks. If we have to run a bit on the sound check, I hate doing it, but sometimes it's completely unavoidable. Yeah. But I always make sure, you know. It very rarely happens that there's a run on, and normally it's the first damn show because there's no pre production. If that happens, you know, it's like even if it doesn't happen, I'm still generally going to be hanging around, making sure that the venue guys are happy, even when my band's off stage, to just check that do they need a hand with anything? Is there anything I can help? Even if it's just throwing mics up on stage, plugging things in, throwing stands up those little touches will help as well. They pay dividends later down the line where you're trying to get your band on stage mm. and the supports have all played because you've, you know, you've gone in there and helped them out. So they're going to help you out when it comes time to be changing over to the headliner and that, you know, yeah. if you, if you've sat there and helped throw the supports on stage and get the, like, like give the venue guy an easier day, then they're going to, they're going to they're gonna help you back you know, totally. when it comes to, swapping across and it makes your life easy because generally you're going to be ready to go 10 minutes before you'd normally be ready to go so you've got time for a beer and a piss and whatever else <laughs> in know. terms of um from doing bands that you're just doing a one-off compared to yeah. um doing a tour now if a band gives you a set list and especially when you're on tour um do you do you find that helpful and how do you use the set list it's it's a strange one to be honest like for a set list the main thing i kind of want to know is like obviously how many songs they're doing what order stuff's happening in if they've got any specific things that they think would benefit me you know do they have a specific effect they want on this song for something is there a specific solo part in this or a sample or anything else that needs to pop through at a specific point, I can mark that down. I can use it as a cheat sheet and basically go, is there anything here that you need at these specific points mm -hmm. and mark it down? Failing that, you know, I'm very busky with how I do things and I kind of just throw up and then I just mix to what I hear. Mm -hmm. So whatever's you, going on, whatever they give me, I mix to that basically. Mm -hmm. And I do just use, um, have the set list there. As a, do you use scenes and stuff like that when you're on tour with the same oh, band I, and I, stuff? I hate them. I yeah. hate them. I hate them. So you just I literally use pair, a pair a song, just mix it as goes? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, ne I never use scenes uh, for bands ever. Like even, even on stuff where I've got specific changes and stuff to do, I always do it by hand. I never do it by scenes because I'm always worried that I still mix very analog and I'm always worried if I recall something, it's going to pick something else up. Yeah. It's like I really never want that to happen. So I'm always like, okay, well, that, that scene is that day. 
that scene is that day, that scene is that day, and I can go, okay, similar size room, D and B rig, cool. Yeah. You know, that 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 looks like Cardiff, you know, or that looks like Birmingham did, or that looks like London did, or that looks like fucking Amsterdam did, you know, and bring myself up a rough starting point from what I've been working on in that too. I'd never, I I, I never really recall scenes doing a show ever I, I hate doing that it scares me <laughs> yeah it, it does scare me as well because I've, I've seen I've seen people come through the venues and you know and everything like is a scene you know but that's yeah, it yeah, tends yeah. to be when they're using video wall and lights yeah, as yeah. a big program of everything together you know and yeah. which is fine but I mean that's when you get loads of pre-production and you get the luxury of doing it but yeah, it terrifies me sometimes. I mean, I've done it through theatre work, but yeah. you still have that in your head going, I'm going to press the wrong button, you know? I was disabled. I, I think I disabled the go button, yeah. Aye, and, and the, yeah, the, 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 yeah. the fire button and the SDs, you know? Uh, yeah. Disable that just in, yeah. in case in the fear. Um, I've seen that on the, on the Pro 2. I've seen people before. I actually had a front house guy in front of me and he was tapping the, the tap tempo <laughs> on the Pro 2. He was tapping away, tapping away, tapping away, tapping, tapping next. <laughs> and literally, the, the, the Pro 2 just mid-song just goes, poof, and the whole PA goes down. And he shat himself, like absolutely shat himself. And I, and I saw what he did and jumped across and went back and go and got him back up but obviously everything he'd done from the point where he unmuted yeah you know well, everything he'd done because we still had to unmute actually um, everything he'd done from the point where he basically saved the sound check was gone so we then had to dial everything back in so he was back to the point where the band walked on stage <sighs> and it was horrible but it was the only thing he could do because he hadn't saved any updates since he'd unmuted so fortunately, we managed to go back and recall and just unmute again. That got him back up in a couple of seconds. But wow, you know, if I'd not been standing there, you know, or he hadn't saved, then he would have been screwed. So <laughs> the, well, it's the importance of having somebody or the house guy being there mm -hmm. beside you, especially if that guy was on a pro two that he's not fully aware of. Then you're there just to, to yeah. jump in and, and save his life, you know. It's, um, that's why we're there, isn't it? You uh, know, it's like that, that's the thing of the house people is if, if all goes tits up, we know the equipment in house, you know, we can help. And just being there to just go up oh, and fix it, you know, that's, you know, if it saves their show, then happy days. We've done half of our job, haven't we? <laughs> yeah, too right, too right. Uh, we've, made, we've made the show happen. <laughs> now, in terms of with, um, it's mostly, as you've seen, the rock bands and stuff like that, do you use the same? Um, make techniques and set up at the desk and everything for all these shows you you know that well this is the way I always do a kick this is the way I always do a, a snare set up and so on or, or dual making guitar amps is there set your, anything that you would class as that's your thing not specifically I do change it up so with like Bob Reynolds for instance he's got this great uh, drummer called Sean Horton um, and he's very jazzy, obviously. So we started, we, we, we did everything predominantly with overheads and kick, and then we filled everything else in with close mics. So we still mic'd up exactly the same way, roughly, but we changed some of the mic selections for different things based on his playing style and how he wanted things. Mm. Um, and then we didn't gate anything at all. Right. And all the EQs were very different, so there was no gates on the whole kit. So you're doing the entire like full full big kit with two snails and everything and loads of stuff going on, but no gates on anything. Then with other stuff I do, you know, it's there's varying degrees of stuff. There is a kind of a rough idea of where I'm going, but I never kind of glue stuff in stone and start to EQ stuff in advance. I just throw a channel list in and leave it blank. I never start pulling up presets, anything right. like that. I always mix to what I'm given as opposed to trying. Again, it comes back to second guessing stuff and changing stuff, you know, until you know what that sounds like, you can do it on the screen, mm -hmm. but it doesn't, 
it doesn't make any sense until you actually hear it and see it in person. I could throw up my basic show file layout, but I'll never start to actually EQ, gate, compress anything until I'm actually at the show and I'm doing the sound check. I'll, I'll, I'll never kind of say it because I never know exactly which way I'm going to approach things depending on how they play. Mm -hmm. So that's obviously no, with a, no a new band or, or, a, or a one off band yeah. you're talking about, not if you're on tour, yeah. you're talking about, I guess. Yeah. In, in terms of um, your desk setup, do you have a specific way that you're always doing the same kind of thing up? Do you use a lot of DCAs? Do you not? Do you use groups a lot? Uh, I use I use groups and I use DCAs for a couple of different things. I'll have the DCAs there, but I'll normally never really use them that much. Um, I kind of use them as a master mute, basically, and that's about it. I'll normally leave them zeroed, and that's it. Um, I normally use four groups because that's the maximum groups I can use on the SQ. Yeah. Um, but I'll, I'll normally have like a drum squash group. Um, sometimes I have that as a a push squash group, and I have them go into the mains, and then I have like a a heavily compressed group I can feed in. Sometimes I'll have it on there at zero and I'll blend between the wet and the dry on the compressor, which just mm. kind of feel, depends how I'm feeling that day. Um, I'll have like a guitars and everything else group. I'll have a vocal group and then I'll have like a back bus group, which is basically everything apart from drums. Um, and that's just so that when people stop singing, stuff rises up and when they start singing, it pushes it back down and you get the vocals constantly glued in the forefront mm -hmm. um but it's like rear busting technique basically um so i'll have that it's just like an extra thing that i'll add but whether or not i always use it it all depends on the venue sometimes you push stuff in and you go oh no that doesn't sound nice and you end up not using it that night sometimes you'll end up blending it or doing it slightly differently so i can i have a rough idea of how i set stuff up uh, the good, main reason I like having the groups is actually so that I can mute front of house but check monitors oh, yeah. because then if I if I unmute the DCAs it'll unmute my monitors because everything's in DCAs but if I leave the groups muted then it won't come through front of house which means I can still leave my house tunes running and everything else going um, and I can test stuff out of the desk into the house desk if I'm running through the house desk or into the second input on the PA if I'm running into like straight into the amps in house, um, so I, I have a, a rough idea of what my setup is going to be. It's normally going to be those four groups. Mm -hmm. Whether or not I use them all, who knows? And then I'll have just DCAs, just drums, bass, guitars, misc, which is normally like keys and other bits and pieces. Anything else that's not drums, bass, guitars, or vocals, basically, um, and then effects. Um, but Again, whether or not I actually use those DCAs to control anything, I normally won't. Just as normally, an I just literally use them as a bait, just to have the option and to have a big mute button. Okay. Basically. Do and you? That means I can mute and unmute. Do you ever set up a, a DFA fader or anything like that? The you, for those. It's a weird one that one. It's a weird one because I don't technically agree with the DFA because it's kind. It is kind of a piss take, right? It's a, it's a good piss take. It's a funny piss take at times, but I've never really found the need for a DFA. Right. It's weird because even if you have annoying people, you can generally talk them around as you're just doing something to get rid of them. But a lot of the time I've actually found that I'll get people asking for stuff and I'll go and I'll go to flip to the layer to do something. They'll see me look down and press something and then before I've even changed anything, they'll go, that's much better. So I've not, I can't say I've specifically gone, oh yeah, <laughs> DFA, yep. but I have accidentally DFA'd on multiple occasions just because just the, the, the physical me looking to do something and looking to change to the layer. Yeah. You know, they are, see, are they you, look down and they go, if oh, they see you just moving, moving your hands. And they think, yeah. oh, yeah, that's it's it. And you've not even got to it's the... subconscious. Yeah. Yeah. It's... it's subconscious a lot of the time. You know, I've never really kind of sat there and deliberately done the DFA. But on many occasions, it's happened by accident, mm -hmm. basically. Just just going to do what they want me to do. 
And then, of course, at that point, they go, oh, it's much better because mm-hmm. they see me go to do something, you know, and they expect that, oh, it's that quick, it's done already. There's a show and that I... consciously think it's better. There's a show that I look after, and it's eight mm-hmm. lead singers and with the band, and uh, there's always at least two singers every... Even though yeah. it's the same desk, same preset, saved from every show, mm-hmm. and every sound check is they ask for the same thing again and go, oh, we've been worthy of this. And I never touch it, never, because yeah. I know they go, oh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, that sounds much better. Yeah. And again, I don't know if it's just a, they, they feel like they've got to put a, their, their stamp on it. or put something in. Yeah, yeah. A, a wee bit of an input. But again, I think it's a, comes back to the sound check part of about making them comfortable. It's, yeah, exactly. It's, it's a, a strange one. I've got a lot of people now who will turn up, like a lot of drummers and stuff actually turn on and they'll go, they'll, they'll go to ask for something and then they'll go, they'll wait a minute, we ask for that all the time and we always get it changed back. So we'll just leave it where it is. So it's it just a comfort thing. A lot of the time people, I think people overthink it slightly. It's a subconscious thing where they're kind of just, mm-hmm. they obviously once everything kicks in, it all changes again. So and when they're listening to it in isolation, sometimes they go, "Ooh, I need a little bit more of that." But then when they come on and they start belting it out, yeah, it's different and it changes. And then, you know, again, sometimes you just have to be able to work out whether they really need it or whether it's something that it's a case of it's going to change during the show mm-hmm. and they're going to want it turned back down again. You know, and the last thing you want to do is throw them. So it's just it's just knowing the right call to make and making sure that you know you're not just doing it because they, they want it but they don't know why mm. so again it's just knowing the artist yeah. and getting them comfortable really so we've all had it but what's the 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 worst thing that's ever happened at a gig or even before a gig or after a gig one of the worst things I've had I've had a, a few bad things happen we had we had some equipment in Spain on one of the tours I was on, that there was a bit of a language barrier and they ended up taking all the equipment away to the opposite end of town. So we basically had (laughs) myself and the tour manager going to the venue to set everything up. The band went to the hotel and then for some reason all the equipment was put in the car like in this people carry a van type thing, which then took the equipment elsewhere and went on a jaunt around Spain. <laughs> um, and then came back and we, we found out at that point, you know, no problemo in Spain basically means we don't have a clue what you're saying. We're just going to smile and say no problemo. Uh, <laughs> so we spent a while getting this equipment back because they thought the equipment was to come back at the same time as the band arrived to sound check. So this was before the gig? Uh, yeah. And then we had a desk that did not sync. Um, so I, was on, I wasn't touring a desk on that tour. We had a desk that would not sync with the stage box at all, but it would do it periodically. It would kind of sink in and drop out again. And they were having a meltdown about how to fix that. We eventually found out that was a network switch. Um, but I've had a couple, to be honest. There was that one, the worst one. That, that was pretty bad, but that also turned into one of the best shows I've ever had in my entire career. It was insane. Spanish crowds are mental. Um, one of the worst ones was doing an outdoor show with two different stages, I think it was. Uh, it was two, two or three different little spaces anyway in one big stage. Um, and somebody on the crew went in to do the D-rig while the main room was still running and pulled the wrong power out of the jenny and put the whole main area into darkness and there was there was a good five ten minutes while we waited on the blinking avo lighting desk and what did i have at the time i think it was an m7 i had at the time so the sound came back almost immediately Mm -hmm. um but the lighting took a few minutes while the AVO worked out that it was a lighting disc and started doing things again. Wow. So there was a point where we had a band on stage playing and we had security on the barrier waving torches around because there was no lighting because they basically dropped the power to the stage. Was this during the night? Was this in the evening as well? Or was this it was during, during the night. It was pitch dark. 
pitch pitch dark in a a, bit, a, a big like marquee. So it was a huge, huge ass marquee. I'm just imagining um, that feeling of pulling it out. <laughs> and just hearing the whole gig behind you go silent. <laughs> Yeah, so that that that, that, was, that was a gig. Uh, that was that, that was a bit of a shame that way. But you know, that and then you've had the usual, you know, pint to a desk. We had that before as well. That was actually we had one in garage where there was a pint went through the, the GLD. Yeah, uh, right. while the touring guy was mixing the headliner, and it was still passing audio to give Alan and Heath the due. You know, if you take your pint, it would just carry on making doing noise. Um, so we completely lost control of it. We had no, no no control of the surface at all. We couldn't even plug a router in. And that was just for the, on passing audio. That was just for support. Um, that happened. That was for the headliner. Or was it that during was the headliner? Through the headliner. But fortunately, there weren't any weird effects or anything going on at that point. It didn't have any delays or anything. So we basically just went. So oh, I guess we just go to the bar. <laughs> so you just let it run. <laughs> so we just let it run because we like, well, we can't turn. Yeah, it off you, you don't want to at this point if it's going to come back on. Yeah, yeah. And what it's going to come back on with, you know, if it even does switch back on. So while it's passing the audio, we just don't fucking touch it. And that's what we did. We basically just sat there and we went went to the bar. Like I got a, a, an iron brew or whatever, and that you got a pint, and we just sat there and just watched the desk and just went, "It's not died yet." You know, we'd mopped the most of the the beer off of it. We're just going, yeah, well, it was, it was dead. It's still I, stuff on the screen, but you I can't think control it's anything. Definitely, it's definitely, a sound engineer's nightmare is pints. Yeah. You know. Um, oh yeah. It's not happened to me. Out of, yeah. but I, I think everybody else I know has happened to. I know, <laughs> and, it, and I'm like, yeah, I yeah. Please don't. Yeah. Uh, I feel like you, now with COVID, you can get all these spit guards, you know, and it feels like we should just get yeah, them yeah. either side and behind. Yeah. It's, it's not too bad when well, I'm, you, I've been spat on a few Rock times. City, you get the option. You get the option at Rock City of a guard. You know, you can have a guard if you want it, but. It, it's, it's not nice. They've kind of got some bits and pieces they set up, but it's not nice mixing in an enclosure. Like it's, no. No. Like, no, we'll keep that out of the way. It's horrible. I don't like that. <laughs> so in terms of, you've mentioned uh, obviously your SQ and D-Live a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Is that your kind of desks of choice? If you had, okay, here you go, you're on tour, money's no object, what would you pick? Life, yeah, hundred percent. It does does everything I want and more. The D Live, so it's like I can literally do everything I need to do, and it sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. So why would I? I I, I would have used to have said, you know, okay, well, you know, I'll take it. I'll take a Pro Series. I like a Pro Series. I would still take a Pro Series, but it would have to be a Pro Two because the bigger Pro Series, the Pro X and everything, I've I've used them on tour. I absolutely bloody hate them. They're horrible desks. It's like multiple Pro 2s tied together. The D Live's small. I can load it in the one hand and it does everything and anything I need it to do and it sounds bloody great. So why would I take any other desk, mm. basically? is the, the way I see it. The SQ is awesome. The SQ is super compact and it does everything I need just now for the small stuff. Mm. So, well, so I'm, I'm kind of pretty sold on the... The Alan and Heath stuff, and I think a lot of people are swaying that way now. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I definitely, yeah. when I bought my SD9 a few years ago, it was a mm. toss up between that or D Live, and I went to the SD because mm. it was a, just a great deal. And uh, don't get me wrong, yeah. I love the SD stuff, but I'm deaf. I mean, earlier this year, I was about to sell my SD to buy D Live before mm. everything had COVID happened. Um, yeah. But definitely that will be uh, in the future because I've got so many SQ desks and I've got the DX168s yeah. and so it makes sense f from my perspective from a higher business um, but yeah, yeah. I, I love the the workflow of the the Alan Heath stuff um, I just became a big fan what, of it what what you see is what you get and what you hear is what you see mm. you know that's the great thing I always kind of say like uh, Digico is very very surgical like overly surgical to a degree if you do the slightest thing, it's a huge difference. Mm. Um, where 
desks like the Pro Series desk, it's a very squishy EQ. You know, you kind of push it to here, but it kind of springs back to here. So you're kind of pushing a lot mm -hmm. to pull it a little. You know, it's, it's very musical. It's very flowy, but it looks very aggressive. If you look at the EQ, and it's not a very good graph of what's going on either. You know, it doesn't really accurately depict what's going on, whereas Alan Heath seemed to have got that perfect ground between, you know, here's what's going on, and here's what you're hearing. You know, mm. it's it's perfect, or as perfect as it can be, basically. You know, if you do something, you can you can almost you, you can tell what it's going to hear like. Oh, you can tell what it's going to hear like. That's bad grammar. Uh, you can tell what it's going to sound like, uh, yeah. basically, when you do it without even hearing it. So, and then you hear it, and you're like, oh yeah, that's pretty much what I thought it was going to be. Sure. You know, whereas you can't really do that on Pro Series, and you can't really do that on Digico. Mm -hmm. It's just it's, it's a really nice intuitive interface, and to me, what you see and what you hear is very similar, and that's what I like about it. Now you've been into hundreds, probably thousands of venues over the years, and festivals, and big shows to small shows, and you've played. I uh, sorry, you've done sound through so many different dynamo boxes. What's your favourite box that you've heard or played through? Like, you know, LK sixteen B Danley. What would you say is your favourite? D and B probably it's always kind of been like the soft spot for me is D and B. D and B always just for rock stuff predominantly. It's amazing. L Acoustics is nice, but I feel that it's lacking in the low end. Um, it's a bit weird. It's a bit like it goes super, super low, but it misses the musical lows that you would get out of a D&B rig. And it's one of the redeeming qualities that, that I really, really, really like in Danley is the fact that Danley has that really musical sort of low med uh, and it's, it's super clear across the board. So... It depends predominantly on what you're mixing, but I find most of the time the all rounder for me that I really, really enjoy is always just D and B. Um, but a new sweet spot recently has been Adamson as well. Right. So I really, really like I really like Danley because Danley's just got incredible clarity, really even coverage, it sounds amazing, it's punchy as hell, mm -hmm. and it's it's just super musical. But I also, the larger Adamson rigs are incredible. I've had some of them out in Italy and Spain and a couple of other festivals and stuff. Um, and it's been brilliant. Uh, we did, I think it was Garish Sound Festival. in is it Milan or something? Uh, possibly. A couple of years ago, and they had a big Adamson rig. And, oh, it was amazing. It was beautiful. That Adamson. Then Digico at front of the house, and I just didn't even care because it was just such nice PA. Adamson said uh, one... <laughs> brand that I haven't mixed a band through. I mean, we, we tested the Adamson stuff when we were, uh, just before we bought the Cara. Yeah. And I did, I, I liked the Adamson. Uh, I did like the sound. And the Danley, I've only had the pleasure of doing it once. Um, yeah. uh, Ian Mackey uh, from A Live had provided that, doing it for TTF at Brayhead Arena. And that was my first time of properly doing it. And I, I was quite surprised. Um, loved it, loved it. Yeah, um, it's crazy, massive. crazy clarity and oh. power you get out of it. Yeah, the technology these days is. Uh, the, it's the larger Addison stuff is nicer. The larger Addison stuff is definitely nicer than the smaller stuff. I think the smaller stuff, although it still packs a punch, it's it seems a little bit lacking. I don't know if that's just a subconscious thing, but I've not had as nice a time on the smaller Adamson rigs as I have on the big stuff. It seems that the more they scale it up, the nicer it sounds. Right. But again, that could just be a subconscious thing. I have had a few nice gigs on smaller Adamson stuff. So, but it would kind of probably for me, it would go D and B, Adamson and Danley would be like my top three. Cool. With the, the main all rounder being D and B, just because I love D and B. So I'm a sucker for DMB. <laughs> so being on the road a lot, you've obviously you're living out of a a very small yeah. case. Um and obviously yeah. with your Pelly. Yeah. Pelly's a very personal thing, you know. Uh we've all got different things in it. What have you got in your Pelly that you would say are your your must, you can't live you need for every single gig, or the ones, the things that have saved you, um, and things that you would recommend engineers would, would get for their Pelly? 
I've not got a huge amount of things. Um, I've got a sound bullet, the Sonic sound yeah. bullet. That's incredible. Great bit of kit. I absolutely love that. I didn't realize how much I was going to need that until I got it, and now I use it all the time. Okay. So I, I never leave home without that. That's a good starter. Um, multi-plug USB charger slash adapter thingy. So I've got one of them, and it's the one you push the button, and it gives you a different plug every time you push a different lever. Right. So you've got it for like Europe, all these things. It's great, but then it gives you four USB ports, a USB-C charger, and then it gives you uh, and a, like a reverse adapter to any style of plug on the other side of it. So I can adapt from any country power supply plug to another one and give myself four USB ports and a USB-C. That's amazing on tour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then bring a four-way to plug into it. Because if you bring a four-way, you only need one adapter. Mm. So I have a spare adapter for Europe. Um, I have a four-way. I plug four-way in with my adapter, and I've got four four 13-amp plugs. And I only use one Euro adapter. So that's handy at front of the house if you want to charge your iPad, mm. you know, charge your phone, anything else, plug anything else in. Good at a hotel room. It's handy on the bus because a lot of the buses are from Europe originally, so they put European plugs in the bunks and stuff. You know, maybe you want to plug the four-way into your bunk, that kind of thing. Um, or we stick water in your bunk, um, bring loads of pairs of socks, um, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but then I've got a nice set of Audio Technicas. Uh, the Audio Technica kind of gave me, actually, when I was down in London not too long ago. Um, they are super handy because they're Bluetooth. I can use them on my phone, but they've got the cable, so I can plug them into the desk. Uh, it's the... MTH ATH M50 XBT, I think is the, the thing for them. But they're great. They're awesome because I've always had the, the Audio Technica M50s. Um, and they gave me the Bluetooth version, which means I can use them on the phone now in the bunk, which is nice. That's cool. Um, failing that, iPad and a Wi Fi router as well. The amount of times that having a little Wi Fi router, even if it's one of the little plug in stick ones that the TP Link runs, mm -hmm. having one of them and an iPad gets you out of so many sticky situations if you rock up at a venue you're not too in the desk and you're stuck in a corner somewhere even if you're touring like an sq5 or something oh wait a minute there's no space at front of the house to actually stick the desk up that's fine take your ipad use your blanket router i always have a router with my desk anyway but you know if you rock up at a venue that doesn't have a router and you've got a digital desk plug your router in away you go you know you're no longer mixing in a shit position. You're mixing in a great position in the yeah, middle yeah. of the room. So that's super handy. And then again, like I've got like a torch. I've got like one of the little LED lens of torches and I've got a rubber duck. So <laughs> a rubber <laughs> duck. Have a little rubber duck with me. Because <laughs> why not? Yeah. Is that just in case you get a bath? Basically, yeah, if you get the luxury of a bath. Um, also, if the rubber duck starts to float during the night, the bus is going off the road and is in the river. <laughs> always handy. Always handy to have these things. Excellent. So, in terms of um, now moving forward, obviously there's no gigs really happening, but yeah. once we start coming back to gigs um, and the new norm or whatever uh, in a post-COVID world, what can you see that's going to change for uh, for us as sound engineers because of COVID? Because obviously we, we know we're going to get people in a room again, but it's things like, yeah. I was thinking about changeovers, you know, of, about cleaning things and having your own microphones and things like that. What's your thoughts? I think it's kind of a weird one. Like I've been lucky enough to be involved in a couple of shows during lockdown, which are like streaming shows and stuff for Planet Rock. Um, so a couple of the bands that I work with have been involved in them. So I've been down there doing that in Birmingham. Um, it's not been a huge difference. Like obviously everyone's been a bit more careful in that. There's been regulations in place with regards to people mingling and that kind of stuff. You know, not, everyone's not hanging around hugging each other and stuff. Um, I think the majority of it's going to come down to people not sharing equipment as much. Yeah. It depends entirely on the recovery, though, of the situation and how much eradication there is of the virus or whether or not we're sitting there going, oh, everybody, for, you know, people walk into the room and you go, have you been, you've been tested kind of thing? Mm. Um, I think people will generally stop sharing equipment as much. 
yeah. if it's going to be a case where it's still going to be a chance if you can catch it as much or if it's going to die off, you know. I don't think a huge amount of stuff's going to change. I think there's going to be more change, not really in the way we do things, but more in the infrastructure, the damage to the infrastructure, the recovery of the infrastructure yeah. is going to be much more severe than what we change. It's not really going to be a change of how we do things. It's going to be a change of how many places there are for us to do things. Mm. And I think there'll also be a change in the entire industry with regards to how people are paid for stuff as well. You know, like it's... Mm. It's forever. It looks like a good job until you break it down into an hourly rate. Mm. And as soon as you break it down into an hourly rate, you go, oh, shit, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it doesn't look so appealing anymore. Nah. You know, how long are you away from home? Yeah. yeah. So I think there'll be a change to that. I think people will be wanting to change, the, you know, the condition of touring, you know. I don't think people are going to settle for... for super low rates and stuff in the future mm. you know it's oh. going to be a lot less price gouging and a lot more you know this has to be a viable job especially with things now with like back to and stuff of setting up a touring branch you know mm -hmm. that side of things is hopefully going to push stuff in the right direction to making it more financially viable in the long term because mm. as we've seen you know there's a small uh, a, a small virus goes around and starts eradicating everything in its path and the entire industry collapses in yeah. the space of, well, for me, it was three days. I lost everything. Yeah. And, you know, we don't have a huge chunk of savings or anything like that going on. So I think that'll be the biggest change will be in how people do things specifically in the industry and where they do it. Mm -hmm. It won't be so much towards things like, you know, they're not going to start changing how we do changeovers or that kind of thing. They'll maybe share mics less, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to be a massive change on that front. I think bands will probably be touring more with their own mic packages, especially the vocals yeah. and stuff like that. I mean, uh, as I was saying to Andy the other night, I was I'm amazed the amount of singers who don't tour with their own mic, you know, and I'm like, oh, yeah. man, just, I think that's changed. I'm really hoping that yeah. when they're trying to cut corners or for tours and stuff, yeah. that they don't go, we'll yeah. put the band out and we're going to cut send them out with a front house engineer or send them out with a monitor. Yeah. Well, definitely a monitor engineer is usually the first one to go, but I yeah. hope that's not the case, you know? Um, I think it's going to go in the opposite direction. Yeah, I honestly just... think that it's going to become more important to have a front house person because it's going to be a case of, you're the front house guy, it's your job to make sure that the fucking mics are changed every day mm. and everything's kept clean so that the singer doesn't end up with the COVID yeah. like halfway through the tour. Basically, that's going to be the thing is it's going to be, you know, we're going to be kind of the germ squad making sure that everything's kept clean. And to a degree, you know, it should be like that anyway. You shouldn't be walking into a venue and you go, ooh, that's a bit funky. Because hopefully you don't need to pick up the, the venue mics at all. But I mean, there's some venues you go into and it's like lucky dip. Like, what germs do you want today? Oh, yeah. And you, you just sit in there and you're like, oh, we'll just, we'll just brush that off before the singer sees it. That's last year's lipstick from the band that played here with the especially spitty singer that likes to eat the microphone. Or, or put you the know, microphone in places you going, that you shouldn't be. Yeah, well, I have I have seen people previously, I've actually had artists where they've done stuff with microphones that you don't want stuff to be done with microphones, and they've had their own specific microphone. It's like, here is your microphone, and when you break this one, yeah, it's going in the bin. And we get another one out of the case, and we use that one until that one breaks. It's, it's amazing so how I have had that. I mean, if fair enough. Bands who, <laughs> bands who like, I all get, I get the whole bands on stage want to wreck their own gear and stuff like that. That's fine. That's their thing, and we all grew up watching bands do that. It's the rock and roll stuff, but yeah, it's understand. different when they do it to your gear or the venue's yeah. gear. You know, and I remember at Dune last year. Uh, on our stage, yeah. the yeah. Uh, one of the bands who were great and they're doing, but the guy st at the end just grabbed the the mic, swung it off the bottom yeah. of the stage, and broke yeah. one of my SM58s. And I'm like, yeah. straight off. I mean, that was yeah. the last tune, and they, they went off. And I just went up yeah. to the engineer and I went, "He's paid for that." You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's 100%. That's, that's ridiculous. Go to uh, do it your own stuff, absolutely fine, no problem with it. Yeah, but anyway, it's been a good chat. We'll end it there. 
It's been um, yeah, it's been nice, man. It's been a good catch up. Uh, thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for your stories. Um, I'm going to do some other yeah, videos again. Not so ah, much was... the stories, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much, sir. And we'll talk to you soon. No problem, man. Cheers, man. Yeah, it's been lovely, matey. I'll see you soon. Thanks. Guys, thanks for joining us for this episode of Live Engineers 101. Please remember to subscribe to the channel, leave a like, and leave a comment. Thanks. Thanks.